Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to this book at lunchtime event, Don't Follow the Wind, edited by Nicholas Hirsch and Jason Waite. My name is Professor Wes Williams. I'm a professor of French literature and also director here at Torch. It's a great pleasure to be here to introduce the penultimate book at lunchtime of the term. As regulars will know, Book at Lunchtime is Torch's flagship event series, taking the form of fortnightly bite-sized book discussions with a range of commentators. Please do look, take a look at the website and newsletter for the full program for the rest of term, and we're developing next term's program now. I'm delighted to welcome Jason Waits today to lead discussion of the book, Don't Follow the Wind, and also of the project of which it is a part. Also on the panel are participating artists in the project exhibition, which accompanies the book and much more besides, Meiro Koizumi and Kota Takeuchi. This discussion was originally scheduled as part of our Japan festival last term, but seems somehow appropriate that it should come after those celebrations, be part, if you like, of the afterlife of that festival, and also connect to the kinds of environmental futures that we're exploring through our networks and programs here at Torch. Don't follow the wind, just a few words about it. It's a, a once a critical, a collaborative and a commemorative project. Part book, part exhibition. It's concerned with Fukushima's radioactive exclusion zone and the long-term environmental crisis occasioned by the fallout of the March 2011 nuclear reactor meltdown. In a second, I'll hand over to Jason who will fully introduce the book, the exhibition and the project as a whole, as well as the other members of our panel. Our commentators, Mero and Kota, will then give their own presentations, drawing on their contributions to the exhibition. The event will then conclude with questions from you, the audience. So please do put them in the Q&A box as we go along. All that's left for me to do now then is to thank you for coming and to introduce Jason Waite. Jason's an independent curator and cultural worker focused on forms of practice that produce agency. Most recently, he's been working in sites of crisis amongst the detritus of capitalism, looking for tools and radical imaginaries for different ways of living and working together. He's curated a whole range of exhibitions. I'm not gonna list them now, but I will say that having been a Helen Rubenstein cultural fellow at the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program in New York, he is currently a doctoral candidate in contemporary art, history and theory here at the University of Oxford. Over to you then, Jason, to take us further. Thank you. Go on. Yeah. Thank you, Wes, and thank you to Torch and everybody for hosting uh, this book launch today um, and everybody for, for being here um, on an afternoon, morning, and evening, uh, wherever you might be. Um, special thanks to Kota Takeuchi and Meru Koizumi uh, for spending their time today and also sharing with us what is an eminently complicated reality on the ground and how they've been navigating that not only since the start of the project in 2013, but also presently today in 2022 as this crisis goes on. Just as a brief introduction, uh, Kota Takeuchi is an artist based in uh, Fukushima in Iwaki in the coastal zone of Fukushima nearby the Fukushima exclusion zone. And uh, Meiru Koizumi is an artist based in Yokohama, uh, who was recently one of the winners of the Artist Mundi Award here in the UK. Um, for myself, I have a very difficult task to try to introduce both uh, the crisis, the project, and the book um, in a few words, which is an exercise in failure. Uh, and this is perhaps very fitting for the Fukushima nuclear disaster, which is also an exercise in failure. So I will attempt to skirt um, this daunting task to just give you a brief glimpse into various moments and then I will pass to Kota Takeuchi, who will discuss his experience living and working in Fukushima and the present day situation 
uh, related to the reconstruction efforts around the Olympics that just took place. And finally, Mayor Koizumi uh, will speak about his work, um, which was destroyed, but um, in its destruction has also become the first work or detritus of a work that has become accessible to the public. So to start with uh, what we are gathered around today, uh, that being the book, um, I'll introduce you to the physical object itself. Um, this is the book, Don't Follow the Wind. Uh, the second book on the project, the first book came out in Japanese in 2015, and this is the first English language book on the project, um, but it is not the last book on the project. This is seen as a placeholder in a project that continues to go on um, and an end which we yet do not know. Um, to say why don't follow the wind, don't Follow the Wind is a title that came from a story from one of the collaborators on the projects, one of the former residents who's been displaced by the disaster. Soon after the earthquake and tsunami on March 11th, 2011, uh, this person got a call from a friend who was working in the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant that's owned by TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company. And this person in the call said that the nuclear disaster is much worse than is being reported on the media. And that this friend should evacuate uh, with him and his family as they lived a few kilometers away from the disaster, from the nuclear power plant. He got into his car with his family and he started driving north. He stopped the car as he was an experienced fisher person and a sailor. So due to these everyday skills, he knew how the wind worked. And he got out of the car to check the wind and knowing where he was in his proximity to the power plant he knew that the wind was blowing the invisible radiation in a northwesterly direction. So he immediately turned the car around and drove his family south to relative safely. For us, the artists, curators, and cultural workers as a part of Don't Follow the Wind, this story was meaningful for a number of reasons. Uh, First of all, it showed the deep friendship and how friendship, even in a time of crisis, can create links of communication that can help save a community. It was also important to us as this notion of rumor that has been really contested around this disaster, um, as well as other disasters but the notion of a lack of trust in official information or officials themselves. And so how rumor uh, can become a tool uh, to help in the face of this obscuring of, of knowledge. And rumor, of course, is also paralleled to fake news and also paralleled to uh, perhaps a lot of our preconceptions around life in Fukushima today. Um, so in this conflicted notion of rumor, how can we requalify rumor to think about its use value, particularly in times of crisis? And lastly, for us as artists and cultural workers, what does it mean that this resident had pre-existing everyday skills and that in the time of crisis, these skills shifted from the ordinary to extraordinary? And how can art and culture also function in that same way at a moment of crisis? So that's the very basic outline of, of the title and, and how we have approached this project. Uh, just to say what the project is and where it is, 
the events of March 11th, 2011 dispersed radioactive elements, particularly cesium-135 that have a half-life of 30 years, which means they exist in their energetic potential for a 60-year total. This radioactive material was spread um, across parts of Northern Japan, um, in the atmosphere, also around the globe. Uh, but the major concentration was next to the nuclear power plant in a 337 square kilometer area, which was forcibly evacuated and which became to be known as the Fukushima exclusion zone. Um, initially, 150,000 people or around there were evacuated from this zone and the surrounding area. Now, uh, over 10 years later, there are about 25,000 people who remain forcibly displaced, and they have been for the last um, over a decade now. The exhibition has collaborated with a number of these residents who are displaced to set up uh, new works of art inside their homes and places of work inside this Fukushima exclusion zone. And the exhibition involves 12 new works by artists and artist groups, including Kota Takeuchi, Meiru Koizumi, Ai Weiwei, Ahmed Ut, Trevor Paglin, Taryn Simon, and others. And the exhibition opened on March 11th, 2015, inside the radioactive zone. However, as the public cannot visit the zone, no works have been able to be seen uh, since 2015. So that's almost seven years now, um, with the exception of Meru's work, uh, which he will speak about a bit later today. So with that basic overview, uh, or a very limited overview of the project, I would like to uh, hand over to Kota Takeuchi to talk about the reality of what it's like to live and work on the ground today. Um, and then hopefully in the discussion um, at the end of today, we'll be able to get back to provide a kind of multi-perspective view on our experiences and the project, its duration, and also more about what the book encapsulates. So Kota, would you like to share your presentation? Yes. <clears throat> so yeah, thank you, Jason, and thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, I'm Kota Takeuchi. Uh, I moved to the Kosai area in Fukushima Prefecture uh, here. Uh, after the 2011 disaster, so I am participating in Don't Fall the Wind project as an artist, but uh, I work and live in this area as a new resident since 2011. Okay, let me share my uh, images. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, in a long term disaster, it can be difficult to understand the present day situation on the ground, especially when there has been an ongoing competition of images to that show different competing realities. So I'd like to talk about the comp competing images of uh, the Fukushima exclusion zone. So it's kind of uh, my personal, one of the analyzes, uh, not the uh, news report, I uh, would like to take this opportunity to share with you the larger context of what has been going on in Fukushima. Uh, to do this, I will share with you recent images of the changes ongoing in the area, uh, especially uh, around the Olympic uh, in Tokyo in 2020, uh, 2021, and my own experience. 
the Olympic and the Fukushima. In Fukushima, after the nuclear power plant accident, the surface layer of the land soil is being stripped off and removed in many places surrounded, uh, surrounding the plant. Uh, this process is called decontamination. In these past four or five years, the, the decontamination project was accelerated to coincide with the 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo. All the decontaminated soil in the whole Fukushima prefecture, uh, except for the, the exclusion zone where uh, it is difficult to return, almost has been uh, moved to one place. Uh, it is named Interim Storage Facility, as you can see the image. I was security guard at this construction site in 2019 to 2020. So I took uh, these photos uh, of construction site of the interim storage facility. On the other hand, watching the news articles, uh, this is a new stadium built in Tokyo for the Olympic. There were some who argued that the huge amount of money and the manpower needed to build the such a big stadium for Olympic in Tokyo should be spent to the reconstruction of Fukushima and the other disaster damaged regions. But the expectation was that the Olympics would bring a broader economic recovery and its ripple effects would be felt in Fukushima too. In 2021, the Olympics came some baseball matches were to be held in Fukushima city. Uh, it's, it's not in the exclusion zone, but in, inside the Fukushima prefecture, uh, there were the baseball matches. They hoped that the visitors to the games would boost the local economy. However, due to the epidemic of the coronaviruses, uh, they were held without the spectators. So in 2013, uh, the slogan, Olympics for recovery, it means the recovery from uh, the earthquake and the nuclear disaster. It was initially used as the reason to invite the Olympic to Tokyo. However, in 2024, uh, this slogan was shifted to Olympics for the recovery from the COVID-19. As the pandemic continued through the games and beyond, it's, it is unclear what recovery means. However, what is clear is that this shifted away the country's and the world's interest uh, or attention from Fukushima. Uh, while it's unclear what is the recovery from COVID. I think the, that said, in preparation for the two, 2020 Olympic, uh, still had some effect. For example, contaminated soil was cleaned up in certain places. When this photo was taken in 2015, this baseball field uh, was also piled with uh, bags of contaminated soil, but now it's cleaned up at, and the public can enjoy uh, playing baseball sports now. All the soil has been moved to the interim strategic facility where I was working. I worked as a security guard at the interim strategic facility uh, for contaminated, contaminated soils from the summer of 2019 uh, to spring of 2020. The working day were long. I was uh, on site from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. At times, uh, as many as 2,000 uh, trucks passed in front of me by, uh, by per day. I could feel in the soreness of my arms as I waved the traffic guide button. 
uh, from morning until night. I felt the determination on the government to finish the transportation of the removal, removed soil by Olympic, no matter what. But fundamentally, I had a question if there were no Olympics, uh, would the reconstruction project has proceeded at the same pace or even happened at all? If more resources would have been shifted to Fukushima, uh, could the re reconstruction effort have progressed uh, even quicker? While coronavirus was certainly unexpected, uh, these questions still uh, linger for me. Then I would like to, to say about uh, competing for the image of the zone. Uh, rather than using the Olympics as a decoration to shift the image of the country and the region damaged by the nuclear accident, I think the focus should be on actual recovery, uh, such as decontamination, disposal of the contaminated soil, lifting of, of the evacuation zone, and the recovery of the agriculture, forestry, and the fisheries industries. I believe that these recoveries have partly proceeded well, but uh, they are still a work in progress. And no matter how much progress is made in the recovery, as long as there are still unresolved issues, uh, politicians believe that criticism of them will damage their image. Such image problems are not only for the politicians. The situation in Fukushima is diverse. On one hand, reconstruction is proceeding at the brisk pace. And on the other hand, there is an evacuation zone that has been untouched since 2011. This is the, the area around the train station in the zone. Uh, that has been restored completely and anyone can come here 24 hours a day. Around here, the evacuation order is scheduled to be lifted completely in June this year. And some residents have already been allowed to stay in the night. On the other hand, uh, this is an untouched abandoned house left in the restricted area. There is still no prospect of when we will be able to freely enter this place. The house in the photo on the left is located in the mountainous area. The house owner is a part of three generations of a family that had sustained forestry in the area for 100 years until they were forcibly displaced. They have had to start again in a different place. And there are also drastic changes, uh, such as the interim strategy facility construction. So this is drastic change, but it's different from recovery. The landscape in this area is changing uh, very much with the construction of a huge pits to fill with the soil and the huge facilities uh, to incinerate waste. Therefore, it is uh, very difficult for anyone to say in general, this is Fukushima in one word. It is really easy to manipulate images from my point of view. I can show only pictures of the progress of the reconstruction such as this, or I can show only images of the destruction and the contamination. And since the consumers of the news are not usually interested in Fukushima's complicated reality with competing images, but easy to understand answers, they are not so interested in complicated and fumbling explanations from experts and evacuees. So for those of us uh, in the middle position, neither victims or 
disaster, uh, no experts on reconstruction project, but frequent visitors to Fukushima, our words are uh, expected to be right from all sides. Of course, it is natural to be concerned about the existence of people who have been hurt by the prolonged disaster, but this makes it impossible to ignore the complexity and the diversity of the situation. And our words become a crisp explanation. Uh, then people lose interest in the Fukushima events themselves uh, while we are saying, uh, this is blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, blah, blah, blah. And uh, this, this is the one side and the, the other side is blah, blah, blah. Uh, our words become longer. And what remains are the polemics of some agitators uh, who use unscientific discourse and the fierce exchange of accusation against them. It's a story, except for the people who continue to the, continue the conversation uh, not to give up communication. In my view, People stay away from Fukushima not because it is contaminated, but because it is politically troublesome. Politically troublesome. In this sense, uh, politicians are obsessed with restoring their image. Uh, this, uh, can you see the left side? Uh, this is a this welcome illustration map celebrates the reopening of the train and invite tourists. The map, which is decorated with a pink color of beautiful cherry blossom, does not depict the evacuation zone, the nuclear power plant, or the interim strategy facility uh, that should be there. Naturally, this kind of image strategy have been criticized It was hoped that the fever of excitement sparked by Olympic uh, could sweep away these kind of troublesome discussions. In the spring of 2020, the central part of the cities, uh, Futaba town and Okuma town, uh, which have the highest population coverage of the exclusion zone was open to free passage and infrastructure is being built in preparation for the actual return and relocation of displaced residents from 2022 this year. TV program uh, broadcasted the Olympic torch runners event here, showing the passion of those who hope for the recovery. Yes, there is a peop many people who hope for the recovery. On the other hand, uh, the journalists uh, aimed for photos that shows the torch event and the contaminated soil in the same one frame. So this is where the competition for the image of the zone or uh, Fukushima come in. Due to the COVID-19, the Olympics didn't have the power to offset the all negative with the positive, but I think it was effective enough uh, the effect was to tire people out. Uh, people who were fed up with political discussions did not have the power to say objections to the directions of the recovery. It's kind of competing evidence. The competition of images can be described as a competition to present evidence people want to include evidence of joy or evidence of sorrow in their photographs. Also, people have grown tired of the competition to present such evidences. Uh, I drew uh, these letters by using my red light button. Then I wanna say about the people who are most tired, uh, some people who continue to live as evacuees, uh, they have conflicting perspective. 
I don't want to make the seriousness of the accident disappear. And I want to get my life and the peaceful daily life back. Having these two things uh, inside of them puts a heavy burden on the mind of the more serious people. One of the stress is such internalizing the comp competition of images, I think. It would be desirable if memorial facilities for tsunami victims or archival facilities for the nuclear accident uh, or artistic expressions like ours could function as external memories to reduce the great burden on individual victims. I hope the Don't For The Wind project and uh, the new book we produced last year can be part of such an external memories. Well, uh, that's it from me. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. I start? Okay, great, uh, Kota. Thank you for your great uh, thorough uh, presentation. I think it was really, uh, he, Kota just told, uh, talked the complexity of the situation, the whole situation, and it was really good. And now I want to talk about uh, my own work in, in this project. And, uh, and so, uh, and my question is that, you know, there's a question of how ethical it is to make a work about disaster, especially as an artist who lives outside of the area. And I think Kota's position is that Kota decided to move into the area to be ethical as an artist. And I don't live in Fukushima, I live in Yokohama, which is like 200 kilometers away. And how ethical it is to make work about them in, in this area. And that's my question. And I want to talk about this question through my uh, pr project for the Don't Follow the, follow the Wing. So uh, when I was invited to do a project, uh, I wanted to make a work with someone from, from the area. So someone, uh, one of the evacuee, I wanted to work, make a work with one of the evacuee, but I didn't have any idea what to do. But uh, the people at the committee of Don't Follow the Wind, such as Kota, uh, Chimpom, uh, Jason and curator Kenji had already established a trust with uh, local people. And so I met this person. He's, uh, okay, let me share the image. Ah, yes. So I met this Mr. Yokohama, Yokohama, and I decided to, I asked him, to be part of my project. And he said, yes, he can do it. So we decided to make work together, but I didn't have any idea what to ask. So I did an interview. I asked, I asked, uh, I asked, uh, I asked, I wanted to hear his life stories. So he's an electrician and running a company uh, by himself, running a business of his own. And his house is just a few kilometers away from the, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. And he was born in this area. He was grown up in there. He had family there. He raised the kids there. He had beautiful garden. He's a, uh, he's a Japanese drummer and he has a workshop behind his house where he makes his own drum. And in the spring, he goes into the mountain and gets some food from the mountain. So he's really based in, in, in this area and he, and he organized festivals under the cherry blossom trees in the spring, every spring for the local uh, villagers. And so his life was there. His whole life was there until the accident. And the accident happened and he had to escape from the area with his whole family. And now he lives like two hours away from, from, the, from the area. And his business, his, his business is still there, but it has shrunk and uh, so all these things I asked, uh, he told me and 
And so I asked him to, uh, so we did an interview. Uh, no, so we, I asked him to be in that, his house for a whole day uh, with my camera. And I asked all these questions and this is his house. When I did the interview and also when I asked him to do a few performances. And one of the performance that I asked him to do during this session, like, during the day, became one of the work to, which is installed in, in a Don't Fall the Wind, which is, uh, is the work that you, you can actually have an access right now. And so let me explain about this work. So uh, one of the things that I asked him to do as a performance uh, is that I asked him to imagine the first dinner that he would have, he will have back in this house again once the you know this exclusion uh, this area is reopened and i asked him to imagine like the first dinner with his wife and i asked him to imagine what kind of conversation he would have with his wife and then i asked him to play out the conversation by himself so he had to play himself and also he had to play his wife so it goes like wow you know what's what's for dinner tonight and his wife answers yeah it's uh, it's pork soup oh yeah it's my favorite pork soup yeah oh it tastes so good uh, to have pork soup in, in, back in Futaba, Futaba is the area Futaba. Uh, and what did you do today and i did that, that, that so this is a conversation that he imagined that he would have probably have once he was back in this house and he had he i asked him to play he, himself and his wife by himself you know and his acting is awkward. He, of course, he's not, he's not so comfortable acting. <laughs> but anyway, he, he, he was happy to do it. Uh, but his acting is awkward, but he express, it becomes very, uh, he ex but this awkwardness is just right tone to express his sadness and also his confusion. And it becomes, a, it became a sound work. And people can wear people wear people wear a headphone, and people can walk around this house with headphone on. So people, so you hear his conversation. He's like he's acting this little uh, acting while touring around his house, which is like this, which is totally destroyed and decayed. Here are headphones, and the whole experience is quite uh, emotional and uncomfortable and awkward and, and sad. And uh, so, uh, but now the house, as just Kota explained about the whole situation, the, the house is now demolished. So now this, the, this, I borrowed this image from Kota's presentation, but now his house is like this. So there's no, more image of decaying house, destroyed house, but people can still listen to his conversation, this this uh, this sound work in this with in, in, against this uh, empty land, and that's the work. And should I? Yeah, why not? And uh, wait, wait. so uh, let me see what I mean. Okay, so so the situation is that you know. Uh, the work, I think the work is, you know, for him, it is not so simple, his emotion, let's say his anxiety. Let's talk about his anxiety. His, 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 it's not that, you know, he just want to come back to this place and restart his life. It's not that, it's not like, it's not simple as that. His anxiety is more like, you know, um, he was, he feel, he also feel guilty because he was supporting the idea of having the nuclear plant in the area. He was supporting this idea. And so, so that, you know, he thinks that, you know, TEPCO or government were his friends, you know, they were working together. And, and his fear is that one day or any, in any days, the TEPCO, the electric company or government can say that, you know, they have, paid him, paid them enough compensation. And, you know, we give you enough so that, you know, now you, you are on your own. 
now you, you know we gave you enough so and you know, he's he's scared that you know any day they can say that you know now you're on your own while his life his business and the, the whole community is still totally gone it's it's just totally destroyed so that's the uh, kind of anxiety that he had when i was making work with him and you know uh so i'll uh, so you know i to make work about disaster like this for my approach is that you know i don't bring my own idea to the area but it's it's more like i i start from the person and i start to get to know try to get to know as much as possible about what the complexity of the situation, complexity of the, the, the emo emotion of the person. And I try to be as truthful as possible to his anxiety or complexity or contradiction that he has within himself. And these things, for, and I try to give a framework where he can express these emotions or express these complexities. And, and by doing so, it becomes a, a piece of artwork that speaks about the complexity without simplifying the situation. That's an important thing, I think. It's, it's not, so the artwork doesn't simplify the situation. Artwork kind of crystallize, crystallize the, the, the complexity and contradiction and anxiety and fear of, 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 of the situation of, and of the person. And I think that's 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 my approach to my that's my ethical approach to make artwork around disaster like this. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I'll stop. I stop here. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Meru and and Kota for two really divergent presentations, but that are so prescient and deal with such important factors uh, that are in this project. And I think um, if those in the audience would like to ask questions, please add them into the Q&A. Um, and I will convey them to uh, Kota Meru. Um, just to say, as, as part of this initial introduction, I think uh, Meru also highlighted why, for example, the link that you initially see on Don't Follow the Wind, which is the website, has a blank web page with two audio tracks. And this question around the impossibility of representation, or at the very least, the problematics of representation, not only representation in a single moment, but representation of a changing and living dynamic and changing and living projects within this longer trajectory uh, complicates this notion of how both the artist and particularly the project Don't Follow the Wind can represent itself. And that is one of the reasons why um, the website, which you see, is literally a blank website with just audio um, a collective audio introduction to the artists, former residents, and others who are part of the project to give one an opening, but also allow that space to imagine perhaps what it is like there, there now. And that is in contrast to uh, discussions like this, where Kota has utilized this moment to speak about his experience on the ground and his experience as a worker there. And in a way, not representing um, others, but just speaking from his own uh, experience as both a resident, um, having moved there after the disaster, but nonetheless as a resident who has lived there um, for the past over 10 years and has also worked inside the zone. Um, and also, so thinking about uh, forums where there can be a more sustained attention and forums where complexity can be allowed to breathe and, and unfold in its contradicting forms. And that also, the book attempts to encapsulate this as well, 
The book also shows images which haven't been seen before because we felt that having the time and the space of a book was a place where it encouraged one to deal with the complexity and the many different perspectives of the residents and the artists and the political situation on the ground and over time. Um, so in that sense, I encourage you uh, to, <laughs> to both look at the book um, and also the various perspectives within that book, which included uh, new essays by art historian Sven Lutikin, um, uh, Jody Dean and her perspective on the situation and also in relationship to COVID, uh, an interview with Silvia Frederici, the feminist theorist who spoke about Fukushima in relationship to a negative commons and the larger idea of social mobilization around disaster, um, as well as uh, contributions by all of the artists in the project. Um, so, and just to highlight as well, what, what Meru um, also alluded to was the fact that um, this is also a collective project, whereas there's not one perspective. And there are a number of also conflicting perspectives on the project. So the project is curated by Chimpom, who were the initiators, which is a Tokyo-based art collective, Kenji Kabota, who's an independent, curator based in Tokyo, Avon Franco Mates, who are two Italian artists who live in the US, and myself, Jason Waite, who is an American based in the UK. Um, and within this compilation, there we also bring to it our own different complex histories. And of course, the US uh, being a former uh, occupier and colonizer in a, sh in a period of Japan, and also uh, advocating for nuclear energy to be uh, brought to Japan also comes with its own historical baggage, um, which one has to navigate and which some of the American artists uh, in the project have also tried to deal um, with this longer, more complex history. Um, with, with, <laughs> with that as a reprise, I will add one small other footnote, which is to say, I might have misspoke earlier in my presentation um, to say that it's actually cesium-137, which is a very important uh, radioactive element that is um, in most places in the zone and beyond. And this notion of misspeaking about this also uh, is highlighted by what Kota mentioned in his presentation, where there is a burden to take on these other skills and knowledge sets within the project, which perhaps we don't have as artists and cultural workers. And this um, perhaps uh, this difficulty to have to represent perhaps in some way, or at least share our experiences and share the knowledges that we've gained through these, these various points imperfectly as our own basis in those knowledges are. So that's to say we're, we're not scientists, we're not anthropologists, uh, we're not public health officers. And yet this project in different points has kind of asked us to approach these different bodies of knowledge and grapple with these different bodies of knowledge. Um, and I realize we are on a, a short, uh, time here and I want to be sensitive to all of our time so I will shift uh, directly to to the questions and perhaps uh, combine um, a couple questions together uh, as we have about 10 minutes relating um, and the the first question um, from Madeline de Filippis apologies for everyone's pronunciations on my um, that I will make um, is asking, uh, about whether the area, whether the government has had a different um, relationship to Fukushima exclusion zone rather than Chernobyl uh, and just leaving it as a dead area. And she also asks, um, do you think that artistic and poetic representation can be made, made an impact in the public realm on behalf of the victims of survivors, which perhaps also goes to the question around representation. Um, and maybe I will add in uh, Cassidy's point for this and then go back to Lena's question. Um, 
and uh, Cassidy mentioned that she lived in Tohoku and wants to know how Inaka is forgotten or ignored. I think there are many familiar with the non-existent north of Tokyo. And I was wondering the pushback that you got from government and local authorities. Um, so maybe uh, Kota, would you like to answer some of those questions? And then perhaps we can go back to Lena's question, uh, which is also for Meru. And then Meru, you could add in uh, the points that you'd like to um, follow up with from, from Kota's answer too. Uh, could I answer um, the the first uh, question the, about the uh, government want to avoid the dead area like Chernobyl uh, through the, the contamination? The, uh, I, I think it, it's uh, the question to me. Uh, and uh, yeah, yes, uh, I say yes, it is. A, uh, in my case, I felt it uh, physically uh, when I worked as the security guard at the site of the decontamination project. Uh, and I think it is something that the people in the, uh, for example, in the tourism industry and in farming and fishing. Uh, so in all kinds of jobs, uh, people feel at their sites, they are their fears. So maybe and maybe it's not only the government's will, uh, some of the residents wish to lift the zone and return home. And of course, uh, there are those who are not welcome speedy uh, recovery. So I wanna say that such kind of disagreements, uh, the quick, uh, quick uh, recovery or slow uh, pace recovery uh, have had the effect of uh, making the situation more sensitive and uh, strained in terms of uh, our societies or keep people's relationships, I think. Thanks, Kota. Um, Meru, would you like to follow up on that? Um, both uh, Lena is commenting on the artistic approach and, and the sensitivity that you raised and then Aubrey also um, raised the, the specter that's also haunting the project of how do you see yourself um, in relation to a cultural reconquest of the exclusion zone? And I think this is a really important um, aspect to touch on of the project. Mm. Cultural reconquest, what, what does it mean? Um, I could, uh, Aubrey, perhaps you could expand. I would say it's, something that's alluded to, I mean, that I think about as well, mm -hmm. both not living in Fukushima and oh, also yeah. not living in okay. Japan, but sure, maybe sure, also sure, this sure. question around dark mm -hmm. tourism or this question yeah, about sure. what it means to invite okay. people or perhaps yeah. not invite people uh, to come mm -hmm. see the work. Mm -hmm. Well, I try to answer, you know, in relationship to uh, what you said about this Madeleine's question, like, do you think that artistic poetic representation can has, has an impact on public realm? Uh, on behalf of the victims and survivors. I think there are, there are many films or documentaries or like people, all sorts of people did, all sorts of artists, musicians, you know, filmmakers, they did so many things about this Fukushima incident in, in the past 10 years. And there, so there are a lot of, and we, we try to, you know, try to refocus on, on this area again and again and again. But of course, it, it's been already almost 10 years. So, so people's attention is going away and less artists are making work about Fukushima. So we feel that you know, it's been forgotten more and more. And in the daily life, we don't think about Fukushima anymore. And we don't think about you know, radiation anymore. So reconquest could be a reconquest. You can say it's cultural reconquest, but at the same time, we need to pay attention to the problems and we need to give, we need, okay. but I think the survivors or victims wants representation, wants to be recognized the current state of, of, of because situation as Kota explained is very complex and it's changing all the time. 
so that you know it's it's never like we can never say like this is the image of Fukushima right now because it's so diverse and so political. So I think as many political or artistic uh, challenge as possible in the area about the issue is is better for, for the victims and and survivors. Of course, we there's a, there's an aspect of uh, uh, I always forget this words. Uh, I always forget this words. You know, we have to be ethical. You know, we, we it can be like spectacle. We can use use the victims as a spectacle. It can be easily we can fit in this uh, this mode of making art. So we have to be careful about that. We have to be ethical, but at the same time, this, that's how I think. I think, uh, yeah. I think many many ways of the ethic, ethical uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I want to say this project is not intended to have the wide and uh, significant impact uh, for the moment. Uh, we uh, prioritize the long term and the personal relationship with the uh, very limited number of uh, the uh, the people uh, evacuees and the collaborators. Uh, so. One of the way, uh, one of the, uh, our attitude is uh, to keep the project is uh, the highest priority, not to make the uh, big, the wide spread uh, impact. I think uh, uh, so the relationship uh, between Meiro san and the, the, uh, him uh, in the video is one of the example. Uh, so, we don't fight with uh, the other kind of activity or other uh, uh, people who say, uh, who wants to uh, find the, what is the justice uh, for the Fukushima or what is the right way. Uh, I think Kota might've frozen. Yeah. Um, just to say, we, we can also go on a little bit further, so an extra five or 10 minutes. So if you have uh, more questions, feel free to add. Um, Character over the and, project. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Kota, you, you just froze and uh, just came back, right? Uh, <laughs> can you hear now? Yeah. OK, uh, yes, to keep the project is uh, uh, our our uh, basic attitude, not to make the big impact to the uh, whole of the world. I think. Thank you. Um, there's a another question uh, by Emily, who is asking if you if Meru and Kota could talk about the importance of the physical location when seeing the work. Um, for example, Satoji Triennale. Um, and other art installations in museum on Inujima, um, which was a site of mass modernization, but yet few guests can reach now. Um, is there a comparison between the utter disaster in Fukushima and what it means for an artwork to stand in sites which are often unvisited in the case of Fukushima, unable to be seen? And wow. especially in the case of Meiru's sound work, uh, now the physical house has been destroyed and how does this change the experience of the sound piece? I think um, the, the special thing about this project is that I have only seen the whole, the entire project just once. I've, because it's not so often that we can visit there. So I think it was one year or two years ago, one year ago, I think. Finally, I could to get to see all the work installed in the area and great thing is that you know it's it's growing over the time so it's the work is stays the same but the environment is changing rapidly so for example the the place where we cannot the place where we still cannot get inside this place becomes wilder and wilder 
and things start to you know, decay more and more while you have these works and the work is the same but you know the the, the surrounding of the, the the environment of the work is changing so that it, it becomes something really special like as Kota just said that you know it's not that the, it's not it just it, it it just exists. It just exists in the time, and you you feel like the work doesn't end there. Its work is still, it's you know, it's still uh, making a new meaning and making a new becoming something different. And their works and also their environment, which is changing and which becomes kind of which kind of start to eat the work, so that the environment becomes a part of project. And I felt like, you know, as we go inside the area and get, go in deeper into this project tour of the project, I felt like I'm, uh, it's, it's a bit like a apocalypse now for me, <laughs> the film. It feel, I felt like, you know, you really go into the, the river, go up the river and you start to see more strange things and, and the, the boundary bet between the work and the environment start to, you know, disappear and it becomes one strange tour of artistic tour of the area. And I think that was so special about this project. Uh, sorry, I, 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 I'm not sure if I answered the question, but I'll stop here. And I, I think to touch on the point too, it's really fascinating. I think Kota was focusing on the individual relationships and the project, the individual relationships mm -hmm. with the residents. And uh, and the individual relationships that we all have, um, where, for example, while I live elsewhere, I will come and tend to the project three or four times a year, at least before COVID, um, with other people in the project. And there's always this sense of care and maintenance, not only around the works, but also of the former residents who are displaced. Um, and that was also unexpected around the project. So what does it mean that we've not just left it as a time capsule, but also um, through taking care of these works, then gone multiple times a year um, to see these changes and to see these um, developments. And yet uh, there's that question that I think Aubrey brought up, which is very important, um, which this project has grappled with or is in the process of grappling with and that is, what does it mean to go there? Or should somebody go there? And in, in a way, the project itself also tracked the imaginaries of the local residents, which when the project began in 2013, many people thought, oh, I will not go back to my home for 50 years. And so this question of even going or getting uh, sustained relationship, having a sustained relationship with the sites was just unimaginable. Um, so this question of, oh, should one go or should one see things was not necessarily on the table. Um, and therefore the question of what could be seen was also taken away, trying to skirt around these questions that Meru was bringing up, which were this sense of what does it mean to see a site of destruction and how do our understandings of those ruins fit into a different logic, which is not necessarily the logic of what is going on in Fukushima. So when we look at these ruins, we see either destruction that will be torn down and then rebuilt, or we see something like Chernobyl where people moved away and there is, you know, these are ruins that are left for perhaps hundreds of years, if not longer. Um, but Fukushima is this place where there has been an attempt to re-qualify or remediate the land and the area. And that means that changes have been going on. And we and the project hasn't necessarily been capable to track all of these changes or to represent all of these changes. Um, and hence, what is shared is to some degree limited. And we hope that within its limitations, this also asks um, people to continue to imagine what is going on and to continue to imagine how a nuclear disaster and the nuclear disaster in particular in Fukushima is quite different than what we've experienced 
um, it both as disasters before and as nuclear disasters before. And in that difference, how can we also come to terms with different cultural tools or different art artistic tools uh, to grapple with that difference? Um, Kota, would you like to uh, talk about the location in relationship to the work also as somebody who lives in the coastal area of Fukushima, but also outside or a number of kilometers away from the zone, there's also a distinction um, perhaps of what it means to be quote unquote local and what it means to be living in that area, um, but also having a very different relationship to working in that area or to even having your work inside the zone a couple, a couple dozen kilometers away from where you are now. Mm, I, uh, my living town is uh, uh, far from the exclusion zone. Uh, but uh, so for me, the exclusion zone is uh, the working site. Uh, no, because I think it's uh, everyone uh, leave out of, out of the exclusion zone and uh, go there to work uh, for their job. So in this meaning, I think uh, there is not so big difference between the Tokyo people or London people and the Fukushima people. Uh, all people uh, see and imagine what is happening in the exclusion zone and uh, some of the friends uh, goes to the zone. So I think this is the uh, perspective by uh, uh, talked by told by uh, the Ushiro san the leader of Chimpom, uh, who uh, leads uh, our, our project first. Uh, he said the the border, uh, the borderline is uh, all, all equal uh, in front of us, uh, equally. Uh, I, I think such kind of thing he said. So. Uh, yeah. Yes, of course, I can say the many different between the Tokyo and the Fukushima and the Fukushima and the, uh, the other place in the world. But uh, I just, I just want to say that um, let's find the, the let's find the uh, concept we can share. How do you think, <laughs> Jason? Thank you. That's that's maybe a great place to to pause um, for today. In the way of this, as we're all excluded um, from this area, it's a condition that all of us share wherever we are are watching and and participating right now. Um, and with that, I would also like to extend a greatest thanks to Kota and to Meru for their time and sharing uh, what has been such a wonderful and rich discussion and to Professor Williams for the introduction and to Torch for hosting this talk. And uh, we hope that you all might be able to come and potentially see the project at some point in time in the future. And until then, um, I hope you enjoy the book.